Let's spend about 10 minutes talking Kansas State football, basketball, and recruiting on KSO Today, a free daily podcast brought to you by K-State Online. It is Thursday, February 20th, 2020. It's a two-man edition DY of KSO Today. This, Honestly, this is going to be more like a KSO show. This is going to go on for more than 10 minutes, I think. But it's K- it counts as KSO Today because if I don't count it as KSO Today, I have to do one of those two. So this counts as both, DY. So you're trying to make less work for yourself. Well, any chance I get you know, to do, to do less is always good. It is KSO Today. We are in University City, Missouri, I believe, right now. Not actually St. Louis, but University City. We have a pretty cool house, so your room was kind of cold. Yeah, it was a cold room. We're by the loop, if people know the right. St. Louis area. Right. So. It's fun, honestly. Flanders is sleeping up in the attic right now because we're recording this at 11 o'clock. He was awake when we came back from breakfast, um, but Flanders may have been up until 7 o'clock this morning. I mean, check his Twitter. I think you can see evidence that he was posting stories and videos and stuff, so he might be asleep for a while. So it's going to be just you and me talking on KSO today, which is brought to you, as always, by both People State Bank and Legacy Insurance. Appreciate them. D.Y., there is a lot to talk about today because there was a K-State basketball game last night. And if you looked at Twitter or the message boards or whatever, apparently some stuff went down in that game. We'll get to that. Um, but how have you felt about your time and the trip to St. Louis so far? That's the number one question I have is how are you doing? I'm doing very well. We had a very productive trip last night when we saw Luke Kasuki, I think, score 28 Eight, points. Correct, yeah. yeah so. so let's talk about that first. So we are here. Specifically to see Luke Kasub, KK State signee, three-star Rivals 150 member. We saw him last night. Tonight, we will see four-star Rivals 150 signee for K-State, Davion Bradford. So that's what the trip was for. Let's talk about what we saw with Luke Kasub. I'm interested to see your perception of him, of course. Like you said, he had 28 points. Unofficial stats, the 28 we know is right. I had him 11 of 16 from the field last night, 6 of 8 from 3. At one point, he hit five straight three-pointers. I think Luke would have told you he did if you watch the video that Grant Flanders did with him. Uh, it wasn't probably a great competition they were playing last night, but Luke himself was very, very efficient shooting the ball. Yeah, the, the, I think the biggest takeaway I had was that um, if you look at the course of his last I think, four or five high school games, his, his, his senior year plus last night, he's really starting to find a stroke as a shooter, which that's a good thing because it wasn't really happening for him early on in the year. Right. And if you think about you know why he's headed to Manhattan and why Kansas State wanted – to add him it was for his shooting stroke so it's good that he's kind of found that and more because you know obviously he shot over 50 percent from beyond the arc and that's certainly a trait that'll translate to the, the college basketball level and certainly something that Kansas State is desperate for right now they don't have a lot of guys that can put the ball in the bucket right. um, just you know off the bounce or catch and shoot from the perimeter and he's certainly someone that, that fits that bill and and size-wise, it, it's kind of always been a question about him, too. Yep. So some people will say he's 6'4". Some people will say he's 6'6". Six, the six. announcement's 6'6", six, six, yeah. right? They're both probably wrong. I both think he, liars. Yeah, I think it <laughs> split the difference. He's probably a hair under 6'5", but exactly. really strong base, uh, lower body, thinner up top, which doesn't necessarily matter for basketball. But I think that thicker a lower body is why he kind of has a little bit more bounce than right. I anticipated, a little bit more explosive. You've said everything that I would have said about it. So really, really good job. But yeah, the things I would add, it's similar to what you said. Um, I would have six four and a half is what I would say. Probably closer to six five than six four if you're getting that specific about it. So he has really good size for a two guard. He is, he'll probably six five when he's playing college basketball. Um, and I think you noted it too. He, he has a unique build. I mean, he has a very thick lower body, as you noted. And he is somewhat explosive vertically, as you can notice, you know, in the video and that kind of deal. He's a... He's almost the opposite. We talk about this with Montavious Murphy a lot. Montavious Murphy's not incredibly explosive vertically, but I think very quick laterally and has pretty good speed. Lucas would be kind of the opposite, where I don't think he's very fast. I don't think he's incredibly, incredibly quick laterally, but he's pretty, he's somewhat explosive, more, more explosive vertically than horizontally. And he's, so it gives him some sneaky athleticism that maybe you wouldn't expect from him. Yeah, and, and if you're going to compare him to someone, and this is probably, you kind of get into a little bit of a stereotype, but I, but I think it's the accurate probably comparison is if you look at Christian Brown, what, yeah. he, what he's done for KU this year, both as a shooter and probably you know, more athletic than you give someone like him credit for. I think that's kind of what Kasuk P is. He's going to be a Christian Brown type player. He probably just isn't 
I wouldn't say as quick or athletically lateral as Christian Brown. Similar shooters, maybe Brown's a little bit more consistent, but a little, they're pretty similar players, probably as high schoolers, and similar to what they'll do at even at the college level. I think. And with like you referenced, Luke has not shot the ball terribly well this year, and this isn't to make excuses for him. But I think something that was noted is he was pretty sick, you know, throughout a good portion of this season. Has just now been getting back to being healthy. And in last night's game, he was the only player on the floor that did not take a rest the first three quarters. He was not subbed out. I think part of that was to see how they could get him back, you know, into motion. Like we said, he, he shot it really well. Um, the Christian Brown comparison, I think, is very good. I told Flando last night when we were watching his highlights, um, and this is not to set an unfair comparison. I'll explain why it might be a, a, a kind of comparison. He reminds me offensively of like a 6'5", six, 6'4", six, Dean Wade. Now, Dean Wade was a great shooter, and I know that sounds like a really, really high praise. Part of what made Dean Wade special was he was 6'10", you know, with that kind of shooting ability and mid-range ability. I think he reminds me some of his shooting stroke reminds me some of Dean Wade's. The mid-range game reminds me of Dean Wade's. I think he might have some of the same offensive skills as Dean Wade, but without the size advantage. That doesn't mean he can't be productive. I think he can be. But I think we'll see what his role can be. And you talk about Christian Brown at Kansas. Uh, I think you nailed it. I think Christian Brown is more sudden athletically, probably a little bit longer, that kind of stuff, probably a little bit better shooter. Um, but that doesn't mean he's significantly better because as recruits, they were pretty similar. You know, Luke is still in the 150, Christian Brown. I'm not sure what he finished, but at one point was a bottom towards the bottom of the 150 kind of guy. I think they're similar recruits. Yeah, Christian Brown, I think, ended up getting closer to the 100. He Luke, did. Luke, I know he, t- he got up there late a little yeah, bit. He yeah, he got closer to the 100 mark. Kasuki is probably going to hover around right at the 150 mark. And that's probably about right because I think Brown's probably a little bit better prospect. I agree. Yep. But still, good to watch. Another name to mention, we won't talk about as much, but Terrace Reed Jr. Um, I believe, I don't know if I said that wrong, but yeah, Terrace Reed Jr. we saw last night as well. A teammate of Luke Kasuki listed at 6'8", 220. He's bigger than 220. I mean, that kid has a huge lower body. This is a 15, 16 year old sophomore again. So he's a four star kid um, for that class, 2022. Flanders has highlights of him up as well. Um, we weren't watching him as close, but just from a body perspective, he's certainly a very impressive for a young man. Yeah, if I, if I had guessed his measurables, I'd almost say he's probably six foot seven, two forty, two forty five, yeah. and he's probably going to for his position, depending on how much he can grow. He's still only a sophomore, right. obviously, but he might be a little undersized at what his position. But he's going to be thick and strong and and powerful because he's going to be pushing two sixty, two seventy probably right. at some point, unless they want to put a cap on it, and they might want to and and. Fairly a- athletic and explosive for that size, too. And, and just it's a little bit of the size disadvantage that he has over people right now. Oh, but no they, doubt but they, about just, it. they just bounce off of him. But uh, I mean, he's 6'7, probably pushing 240. And he had some standing still where he just jumped up and dunked it without a run yep. up. So he is explosive for, for that size as well. Already a four star prospect. Um, still kind of figuring everything out. I mean, we talked, you know, to some people around the Chaminade program where. You see him, and he's like, oh, this guy's a monster, right. and he is. But then you talk to him, and you realize he's still just a he's kid, a too. He's a baby, yeah. just kind of maturing still, you know, from that standpoint. And you can kind of tell that in his basketball game, too, because, you know, after one half of play, I was like, man, I'm not sure that their other post isn't a better Correct. player. Right. He probably and, was better in the first half. Yeah. Right, yeah. And then in the second half, I'm like, okay, this is why he's a four-star. Uh, another, another player to watch. We don't have a lot on him yet. I'm going to read Flanders wrote a notebook from this I haven't edited and put on the site yet um but a number 20 for Shamanad the last name of Mayo another young kid I believe he's a 2022 kid he's not a big name on the radar yet I don't know that he's got I, I gotta check he's got a profile right now from rivals I don't think he has heavy case at interest right now but he is a very good athlete and he was an absolute dog on defense last night for them so it may just be another name to watch in the future we'll get you more on him I'm sure Flanders wrote about him in that piece so just something to look out for as well if they're looking if you're looking for what came from that game Go to the K-State Online YouTube page, which you're maybe on right now listening to this show. Flanders has highlights, which include every basket Luke Kasubki made in his 28-point outburst in three quarters last night. A full interview between Flando and Luke Kasubki after the game here outside of St. Louis. We were, where were we last night? What town was that? I don't um, remember. Where it Belleville, was. Illinois. It was, it was, it was we were in t- Illinois. Yeah. Catholic High School. We ate in a nice, a nice restaurant last night there in mm. Belleville, Illinois. Yeah, there. it was it named was after the address, and I don't remember it. 4204 Main Street, I think it was. Okay. Something like that. You have um, dyslexia, though. <laughs> right, I do. So, yeah, I do. It could have been 4024. Who knows? But it, was, it had numbers in Main Street. They were very, very good. Um, but you can check those all out. And also, like I said, I haven't edited it yet, but if you're a member of Case Stood Online, it'll be a premium story. So today you'll see Flanders' written uh, evaluation of the players he saw last night. 
DY, we've got to move on to you know, probably the bigger topic. Uh, we were not in Lubbock last night for absolute clarity, of course. We chose to come here uh, for these two days and watch recruits. We're not going to pretend we were there. We weren't there for the press conference. We weren't there for all that happened. We watched it on TV like probably everyone listening to us did. We saw the situation between Cartier Jada and Bruce Weber. Saw the rest of the game. We have to talk about the Cartier Jada stuff first, I guess, before we talk about the game. Um, and, uh, he said, you know, he says, uh, he more or less talked about what, I think the wording is coming out. He said, well, you know, watch me make this shot. I don't, I'm, not, I'm trying to paraphrase some, but it wasn't as bad as what some believed it was to be. When Bruce Weber was asked about it by Kellis Robin in the post game, you know, he more or less said, hey, it was a fired up guy in the huddle. And now, at a time when I heard that, I thought, boy, is that really what happened? And then you go back and see what it was actually said. That's probably what it was. I'm not defending what Cardi did. I'm not defending what Bruce did. We're going to talk about it because clearly it's not healthy what went on there, in my opinion. But it wasn't as bad as some believed it to be. Yeah, not healthy, and really what's going on between Cartier Jada and Kansas State this year has kind of probably fit that description throughout right. the season, and it's probably played into some of what the record is right now. Right. And when that happens, it's usually both sides that are responsible. Yeah, I was just going to say, and it takes two to tango, man. It's, yep. And rarely in life is it ever one person's yeah. fault. Yeah, you know? we always get you know blamed for you know being the apologist for Bruce Weber. Right. We're not here. That right. He has probably mishandled the Cartier Jada situation. We've said that over and over. Mm-hmm. And Cartier Jada is also accelerating it as well. And it's just right. not a not a great situation. However, I think last night was probably, and you know, our initial assessments was probably the same way. A little bit of a reaction to yeah. by everyone, including us, when we watched. We watched it. It on TV behind closed doors. Yeah, we reacted. Yeah, you know, we, we I mean, react- we kept it to ourselves, but I mean, we but we reacted. Yeah, yeah, we, we, saw we it like reacted. Else did. Yeah. The, but when you you start to. I guess decompress and kind of just analyze what actually happened. And it was probably a fired up player in the huddle. And it was also still probably a little bit of bad blood between Weber right. and Cardi right now, no matter how each of want to downplay that, but it wasn't as bad as what everyone wanted to make it out to be. And what you saw between those two, probably not probably, it does happen a lot between players and coaches because it is a competitive environment and everyone wants you know, thinks they're right, right and the stuff. Usually you see it behind closed doors. And that was probably the fault of both of them that they let it play out yep. for, in front of all of us to see. Because I imagine that wasn't the first time something like that's happened between those two this year, but it's probably happened at practice. Probably happened in no the doubt. locker room. Probably happened, you know, in Bramlage where no, none of us are able to see it. It was yeah. right there for all of us to see last night. But at the end of the day, I think it was probably much ado about nothing but – a larger symptom of the problem that continues to exist between the two sides. No doubt about it. Just a funny aside, as you reference, like this kind of stuff, people get fired up in this program behind closed doors. We like, get fired up between right, each we other. We get fired up. But yeah, this, that stuff happens. And I, just a funny aside, like, and I've told the story on this, our, our podcast before, but the first, like, the first media availability of the season we were invited to, I showed up obnoxiously early, and we were allowed to, actually, and I sat there for the last 10, 15 minutes of practice. And I told you this story, and I've told on here, that Bruce Weber, I, I still don't know who the player was. I'm, I'm just going to, this is me guessing. I'm not passively, I think it was Sean Williams that he lost his mind on at the end of a practice. And I heard him yelling like I'd never really heard him yell. And then later, Bruce kind of said to the media, I think it was when somebody told him, hey, you talk about coaching the team harder, that kind of stuff. Bruce kind of passively said to the media, hey, that practice you guys were all invited to and didn't come to, you would have heard me, you know, how I talked to this team behind closed doors and how I actually coached them. And I kind of sat there and chuckled. It's like, well, I was there. I heard it happen, you know. But, I mean, the point is, this kind of stuff's not that uncommon, but seeing it like we saw it on TV, we're not, I'm not saying it's okay. It's, it's not. not okay, period. It was inappropriate on probably both sides. I don't think a player can say that to his coach the way he did, and I think Bruce Weber has done things. Um, that have led Cardi to feel the way he feels, so I'm not taking sides. It's not okay. But what we are saying is when Bruce Weber says it's fired at people yelling at each other, that's probably the truth. That that's what is what happened last yeah. night. Yeah, that's what it was. You don't want it to happen in a game. No. And that's that was really the fault of it, that they let it pour out during a game. But when it's you know fired at people, that's ex- exactly what it was. And it also kind of gets to the point, and I'm not trying to harp on it, but when he keeps talking about being coachable, like – he he wanted something done, you know, with that ball Correct. screen. And and I'm not really ratting Cardi out. He actually admitted this in his Instagram post. Right. He Bruce wanted it done this way. Cardi was stubborn and still did Correct. it that way. And that's where the confrontation, you know, occurred. Right. And that's the thing too, where we'll move past this Cardi Bruce thing or whatever. But that's because we're not. We don't want to convince you to take sides. That's no. not our point. But that's the thing you have to understand. If you're looking at this situation, if you're trying to say, well, Bruce is doing it wrong or Cardi's doing it wrong. Cardi, to his credit and a maturity, admitted, my coach asked me to do this. I ignored it and did this. That's going to usually cause a situation. Um, 
in any in any line of work. You know, we're pretty close. I think we're pretty good friends. We don't get in many fights, mm-hmm. and we don't play a lot of boss employee stuff. But we would get in a fight. You know, we got I mean, a fight about Iowa State football. We absolutely, <laughs> have to where it, it's absolutely it absolutely can happen. Um, that said, we're, we're not trying to gloss over it. It is a problem. You know, people have asked on the site and stuff about, hey, is there anything rule to this Cardi about? possibly moving on after the year. And I said on, on the board last night, I'm almost embarrassed to say, like, I've been saying for two months on this show before any of the stuff ever happened that he's not going to be back next year. I thought it was already kind of understood and a poorly kept secret that the idea was this fourth year junior, real year senior with a degree who's had a good career is going to go play pro basketball somewhere. Like that's not a surprise. And I even wrote on the board, like, I don't know that that's the problem of all this. The Fran Fraschilla comment about it being a problem. That's an opinion, whether it's a fact or not. I don't, I don't know. But like he, what I'm trying to say is Cartier Jada could have had an understanding he was going to go pro this next season without it being a problem for the program. It wasn't at the time. I don't think that's why this has gone bad. It's gone bad because K State's losing a lot of games. Cartier's one of the best players. He's making mistakes that are easy for the eye, the eye to see, and fans get worked up. You know, I mean, that's really why this is a problem. I don't think it's because Cartier Jada has pro basketball aspirations. I, mean, I don't think it's about the pro basketball aspirations. You have to be able to handle those aspirations. And sure. You know, and, and it's part. And, I'll, I'm sorry. I'm talking a lot. It's part of it. It's yeah, actually no, part no, of it. But yeah. It's not the problem. It's, well, it's, it's not him being wanting to leave after this year and go play pro basketball isn't the problem. The right. problem was he hasn't been able to manage the two separately because you see it all the time. Like, do you th- here's an example, and I, I use Ohio State, but you're going to have to bear with me on sure. this one. You're shocking, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Defensive end Chase Young of Ohio State. Yep. Do you think he entered his junior year when he was already projected right. a top 10 pick, thinking, hey, I'm going to go back to Ohio State next year? I'm he sure, did not. I'm sure he did not. <laughs> he, yeah. he, he started the year saying, I'm going to go to the NFL next right. year, and he already knew it. He had those aspirations. That was his plan. That was, right. He probably had his mind made up. It certainly didn't affect him on the field at all. Mm-hmm. So you can do that without it affecting your play on the field or on the court. But you have to be able to handle that and kind of approach it that way. Some people can, some people can't. We're seeing that Cardi's struggling in that manner. And right or wrong, and I mean that sincerely, right or wrong, I'm not passively saying I agree with it, what Fran Fraschilla said or anything, that discussion is going to come. If a guy is underperforming based on what was expected of him and he's seen as a pro prospect, a human brain can naturally put two and two together and say, well, it's, it's because he's too worried about his future. It doesn't mean that's right or accurate. Like I said earlier, I don't think that's more than 10 or 15% of whatever this problem is between Cartier Jot and Bruce Weber. It's not that. But it's not uncommon either or wrong for a human brain to think, well, this kid's not playing as well as we thought he was going to. He wants to go pro. Add them together. He's too focused on the future. So I think it makes sense why people think that, even though I, even though I don't think that's really what caused this problem. Yeah, it's not always that linear. I mean, Cardi John is not even the only player on K-State's roster right now that has pro aspirations. Correct. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. I mean, and yeah, we can talk about it forever. But I mean, the game last night, uh, K-State falls to Texas Tech. I thought K-State from what, you know, I'm not going to lie. It wasn't there. We were watching it. We didn't... W- the first half of it, we were watching it on our phones because we were at the game watching Luke Kasupke. I'm not going to pretend that I have the greatest you know, grasp of what happened in that game last night. From what we saw, K-State played pretty hard. They got back, same same story every time, they got back in it. Of course, the biggest play that we all remember is when they were down two. Cartier Jada had a wide open dunk to tie it. He misses it. Instead, they go down and go up five and the game is over. I do agree with the, what I've seen some people say on Twitter. Like, hey, if you all love Cardi for the Wimbledon dunk against KU, you can't really kill him for trying it against Tech and missing it. I think it's actually fair to say. It's totally fair to say. But as you also know, if you're going to do that, you have to make it. And the fact that he didn't, even though we were all okay with the action against Kansas, I don't think it's super, super hypocritical to say, hey, dude, you missed it, so it was the wrong move. Um, because case it goes down five there instead of tying it up and that game's over at that point. Yeah. That's, that's strong to say. They did get it back down to three at that point. They had chances. That play didn't lose the game. That was an over-exaggeration by me, but I thought that was the biggest play of the game. Yeah, I think the best way to describe that, it's not what lost in the game, but it was a missed opportunity. Would have tied right. it. To I perhaps think. win the game. Yeah. yeah. It was a missed opportunity. And, and really – when we say it didn't lose the game, it didn't, but it was just kind of the poor timing of it. It's not hypocritical to say, hey, why does he do that? Missed the dunk. Right. The windmill worked against KU, so it's a little bit hypocritical. But then you, if you add a, the other nuance in it, that happened not too long after his dust up. So Correct. if you're going to have that all, kind of dust up, all of it put together. Yeah. Right. yeah. So if and you're he going was up five, we did it against Kansas instead of down two against Texas. There are some differences. Yeah. Right? He yeah. says, watch me make Correct. it, I'm going to make it. And then you miss a dunk. It's just, you know, the combination, it's not great. The way, uh, again, we didn't see much of the game. We saw most of the second half. Yeah. So that's where 
our viewpoints and vantage points are coming from. But for me, and it's probably, you know, you could say this for just about every game, especially since they've lost two of the last 14, I think. Yeah. But uh, it just seemed like they they would get down by 10 and then cut it to three or four. Then the lead would go back to 10. They cut it to three or four. So it's just a team that can't get over the hump. Correct. Whether that's from the totality of the season, they can't get over the hump or even within one game. That's what it can't get over the hump. I do want to give credit to a specific player being Antonio Gordon uh, behind closed doors. I'll be honest. Like we have different opinions on Antonio Gordon's like potential future. Uh, Flando, since he's not here, we're just going to exaggerate his side and lie about it. Flanders thinks he's a future first team, all American. <laughs> we aren't sure yet that he's a, that, it, that he is you, you and I, that he's a serious, like long-term starter or piece for this Kansas state team. Um, that's if Flanders doesn't think he's an all American. We just have some debate about where he sits in that pecking order. Anyway, he slices it, though. He was very good last night for K-State, of course, against a very good team on the road. So a lot of credit to Antonio Gordon for that. I believe he went 6-7 to seven from the floor for 14 points. I think he had eight boards last night. He was very, very good for K-State. So credit for that freshman, his best game of the Wildcat by far. Mm-hmm. I would agree, yeah, especially since you know his minutes were declining, Correct. his play was declining, just everything really wasn't going the right way for Antonio Gordon. He had his suspension. Yep. He's had a couple other games where he – didn't get a technical or suspend or anything, but he was also kind of chippy. So right. he kind of has that edge about him, which it's probably going to serve him well in most cases and maybe not in some others. But it was probably good for his overall, I guess, morale and psyche to have a game like that, the right. way that it had been going for him. Uh, Monte Murphy was his steady self. I, I always kind of want to emphasize or kind of dwell on the players that are at least going to be coming back next year, right. especially the newcomers that do that they want to be the core of this team. And some of it's been optimistic this year and some of it hasn't. And, and obviously injuries and just the way this year has, has probably played a role in it one way or the other. But I would say that for the most part, it's fine what the freshmen are doing, but I, I definitely think they expected more out of them. I think so too. Some, I, uh, Especially we, Dejuan. We did a deal. For being honest. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. We On a KSO show with Flanders and I, maybe two weeks ago, I wrote just 10 hypotheticals and one of them I said, was hey these freshmen have been good enough you know as as a whole by themselves to give you hope that next year is going to be great and I said no and that wasn't to knock the freshman class like because the answer doesn't we joke all the time like mm-hmm. life's not in extremes everything doesn't have to be the best or the worst things are usually in the middle and I said well I think they've been encouraging and I think they're a good freshman class I would say yeah by themselves they're not these three five star slam dunk you know they're going to be elite players Antonio has work to do Monty we both you know we both love the prospect and player. But he's not the kind of guy who as a sophomore is going to carry you to 10 wins in the Big 12. And Dejuan Gordon, who I think will take a big leap next year. I know he's battling through knee knee issues right now, and he's just hit the freshman wall. I think he has disappointed in relation to his recruiting ranking and what I would have projected going into the year. I still think he's going to be a star. But the fact of the matter is, the three of them have not, you know, blown the doors off to the point where you can just say, hey, except this season, even though there's only two Big 12 wins, because those three freshmen are future superstars. They haven't shown that just yet. For so sure. Some of this is based on my expectations, but Antonio, I guess, hasn't really disappointed because he didn't come Correct. in with I a think he's yeah, him. He, yeah, he didn't come in with a lofty recruiting ranking, and I wasn't sure he'd get as many minutes as he has, to be honest. So he probably probably hasn't you know disappointed in terms of the expectations that I would have had for him but yeah again a lot of that depend was dependent on his not as lofty recruiting ranking Monte Murphy I think he's probably played out his recruiting ranking yep uh, he is someone that I think is going to be a very valuable piece for the Kansas State program not just this year but the next three years I, I think he's going to be a, much. pretty much a four-year starter I don't know that he's going to certainly get you know, inexplicably much better because I think he's a little bit limited by certain things, but I think he's going to be a very valuable glue guy, I guess is what they call it, for four years. And you need those players, so I think he's very valuable. And Dejuan Gordon, I think next year is going to be the barometer for him. I think this year, based on the, you know, lofty recruiting ranking that he did have and some of the excitement that did surround him because of how he even performed for USA Basketball, I think it was very – discouraging freshman year so far from yeah. him regard you know some of the other circumstances notwithstanding of course but next year has to be a good one or at least lift up the you know his play right substantially from where it is now or then you start to if wonder he's going to be the type of player we were projecting him to be right. absolutely right i think that's totally fair i, I still think it'll happen Sophomore year is going to tell us all, everything it's total, about it's day totally one. fair. Um, of course, it'll be interesting at this program to add, you know, the names we talked about, uh, you know, Luke Kasubke, Davion Bradford, we're going to see tonight, Nigel Pack, Selton Miguel, Casey Eziagu. Of course, a lot of st- the talk's still going on with Donovan Williams out of, you know, Lincoln, the four-star kid there. I think 
I think K-State's in decent shape there. I'm not saying they're going to get him, because I always say this when we talk recruiting, and you know it better than I do. I think K-State's the most likely individual school for Donovan Williams, but I don't think they're significantly more likely than Oklahoma State, Texas A&M, you know, Kansas involved, now Oregon involved, Texas involved. I think the field is still a far more likely bet than K-State, but I do like where K-State by itself, from what we've heard at least the last three or four days, stands with Donovan Williams. Yeah, everything we've heard the past three or four days definitely would uh, not be a bad thing for Kansas State. Uh, no definitives there, no done deals, but right. uh, none of the buzz that has kind of came out on Donovan Williams in the past week that we've kind of acquired would be negative for K-State, but it, it seems like it's still, I wouldn't say far from over, but long you know, process probably still, still, you're right. still a couple of months left. Absolutely. Well, hey, we appreciate you guys listening to us today. We're going 25 minutes on KSO today, so that's two and a half times longer than I say in the intro, so I hope you aren't mad at us for it. Um, but there's lots to talk about today. We've enjoyed our time here. Like I said, we will be at Melville, I believe, High School tonight to watch Davion Bradford. Same as last night. We're going to have, you know, Full Heights interview with Flando and Davion Bradford. We talked this morning. I'm excited to frame up Flanders with a seven-footer, you know, for an interview and see how funny he looks. Um, it's going to be good. But, man, D.Y., I appreciate your time. Appreciate our sponsors. Do we say anything else in this? Tell your friends.